Hi, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to be on here with all of you, and I'm really excited for this event. Um, my name is Aaron Kirschenbaum. Um, I'm a member of the Student Steering Committee of Judaism on Our Own Terms, which is a national movement of independent campus Jewish organizations promoting student self-governance, open dialogue on campuses, and the wider Jewish community. Additionally, I'm also a current student at Clark University, where I'm part of an awesome uh, Jew member organization or chapter called JIGA. Um, so this event is called Nostalgia and Reality, Black and Jewish Relationships in the 1960s and Beyond. And this is a part of our three-part uh, series called Setting the New Agenda, a speaker series on anti-Blackness and the Jewish community. Finally, this event is also co-sponsored with Jewish, by Jewish Currents. Um, founded in, Jewish, in 1946, Jewish Currents is a quarterly print magazine committed to the rich tradition of thought, activism, and culture of the Jewish left. Um, and I'll pass it on to Leah. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah. I'm also a member of the steering committee and excited to be here with you all. And I've been working closely with Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, also known as JFREJ, and especially the Jews of Color Caucus since I got to Barnard. And I just graduated last week, so it's been an amazing four years and counting. Um, JFREJ is an organization and dedicated peoplehood fighting to empower communities that face state violence, economic inequity, and structural oppression that governs the resources and systems that affects their lives. Um, our partnership with Jute for this series is an aspiration to grow people power and educate others in transforming systems of oppression. So I thank you all for joining us and I'm glad to be here with you all. And I can go to start introducing our speakers if that is all right with everyone. So we have with us here today, Professor Lewis Gordon, a professor and head of Department of Philosophy at University of Connecticut, honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa and honorary professor in the unit for the humanities at Rhodes University, South Africa. Uh, professor Gordon previously taught at Brown University where he founded the Department of Africana Studies in Temple University, where he was a Laurel H. Cornell professor of philosophy and founder of the Center for Afro-Jewish Studies and the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Thought. He's the author of many books, most recently, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, as well as the forthcoming on philosophy, decolonization, race, fear of Black consciousness. And also joining us is Professor Cheryl Greenberg as the Rivther Distinguished Professor of History at Trinity College, in addition to a number of articles and anthology chapters on whiteness, racism, Jews, and race and relationships between African Americans and Jewish Americans. She has written three books, or does it explode Black Harlem in the Great Depression, Troubling the Waters, Black-Jewish Relations in American Century, and to Ask for Equal Chance, African Americans in the Great Depression. She's also edited the books, A Circle of Trust, Remembering SNCC, and with SNCC workers, Joe Bateman, A Day Never Seen Before, Marx, Mississippi, and the Civil Rights Struggle in the Rural South, forthcoming from the University of Georgia Press. I take it that we begin. Um, still uh, a few more introductions. Okay. Um, Cortland Cox is also here, um, and he served on the executive committee of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. He served as the SNCC representative of the steering committee for the historic March on Washington and helped to organize the 1964 Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Mr. Cox was one of the organizers of Lowndes County Freedom Organization, LC, or LCFO established in 1965 in Lowndes County, Alabama, which only had four registered African-American voters despite being 80% black. The LFCO's work enabled black residents to take control of the local government uh, within four years. In the 1970s, Mr. Cox served as Secretary General of the Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania as well as on the board of TransAfrica, which advocated for the end of South, America, South African apartheid. In more recent years, Mr. Cox has served in a variety of local and federal government positions, including being appointed by President Clinton to serve as the director of the Minority Business Development Agency, MBDA, at the US Department of Commerce. He currently serves as board chair of the SNCC Legacy Project. Ira Grupper is also here, and Ira is a veteran of the civil rights movement in Georgia and Mississippi, and former staffer with SNCC, among other groups. 
He distinguished 19, his distinguished 1960s jail record spans both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. In addition to later decades of labor union organizing and disability rights advocacy, Mr. Gupper served from 1989 to 1993 as national co-chair of the New Jewish Agenda, which had 50 chapters in the US and Canada and campaigned for a broad range of progressive issues. More recently, Mr. Gupper served as a commissioner of the Louisville Metro Human Relations Commission and received the Louisville Mayor's Lifetime Achievement Award. A retired factory worker and adjunct faculty member at Bellarmine University, he currently serves on the Greater Louisville Central Labor Council, the Kentucky Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, is a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. He speaks to high school classes on the civil rights movement. Lewis, you're up. Thank you. So to everybody who is gathered right now, I um, begin with Shalom Lanatov. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Vani Khan, Hotep, Holito. So many languages in which we say hello or good evening and so many ways to say him. And it's indicative that in so many of them, it signifies peace. I begin also by sending my condolence to so many who have lost loved ones uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to many of the unfortunate mishaps and tragedies over the past year. Uh, to lose a loved one is to lose the irreplaceable, but as we know, everyone is irreplaceable. Striking to me since um, not only have I lost so many with whom I'm close, but it just continues to go. I lost another relatives, part of my family side yesterday, Solomon, Michael Solomon. So I begin first by thanking you all for being here. Mazel tov Leah on your graduation. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction. And thank you, my co-panelists. It's such an honor and it's wonderful to be with you. One of the things we know as we gather together, especially in a context like this, we should remember always that ultimately, although there's pressure to forget what we're about, uh, what we, and the we I'm using here is the most inclusive we as understood in the ethics of how we understand ourselves as human beings, and also many of us as Jews, is what it is to come together in a common struggle for what is right. Now, when we talk about the, okay, the, the context of this meeting, uh, usually when we say civil rights movement, there's a specific kind, a specific period we're talking about because there were actually many civil rights struggles and also many struggles that were not about civil rights, but as El Malik Al Shabazz or Malcolm X would put it, human rights. The shift to civil rights is very specifically connected to something palatable to liberal democracies. Now, these many movements before what we're talking about as a civil rights movement, because specifically one of the crowning achievements of the civil rights movement was a Voting Rights Act of 1965, which as many of you know, if you think dialectically, the opposition has been fighting against from its inception. In a way, what we're witnessing now is the GOP attempts to solidify blocking enfranchisement all across the country. We know it's racial and class uh, implications. But before that, before the 1960s, there were many struggles and they were avowedly, clearly uh, left-wing oriented. Indeed, the many movements of uh, specifically Eastern Europeans that came over through the United, to the United States, many were linked with left movements who were thinking about global emancipation, global access to democracy. 
within the US, but also before it became the US, the colonies and along the British colonies through Australia and all across the globe, there was a peculiar difficulty around what we could call Anglo-Saxonism that set the framework for full membership in terms of a, an identity that eventually took the form of whiteness. Now, what is often forgotten is how that foundation had a history in which just frankly, no Jews were white. So it meant that for Jews of all kinds, not just European Jews, but Jews who are coming from Africa, from Asia, uh, this was a situation in which membership and identity was connect, were connected to ongoing struggles against dehumanization. Now, there were other groups, non-Jewish Italians, non-Jewish Greeks who faced these issues. But you see, what is not uh, realized today, and it's for reasons we could discuss later, European Jews particularly, were already linked in to questions of blackness. If you look at most of the racist literature, particularly in Europe, the term for European Jews, today we just say Ashkenazi, were, was mulattoes. And I often quip that if you look at some of the early pictures of a varieties of left movements and the individuals were to pose because of the way the United States looked at race, a lot of the leadership who are also mulattoes were indistinguishable from the European Jews. Now, if we move outside of that framework, there were also non-light-skinned Jews, many all the way through to the Marcus Garvey movements who were fighting for social change. But the one that's now in the popular memory is the one that culminated in what we see in documentaries where the prime image would be Rabbi Abraham Joshua Eschel and Reverend Martin Luther King arm in arm. And in a way that matches what many would prefer to see because it's very neat. It has the now by this point constructed Jew as white and the black as Christian. And what's erased is the complicated history of how we can understand Jews of many kind, kinds as people of color, but additionally, the role that Jews played and the roles historically, many blacks who are not Jews played in organizations that were fighting for actual democracy in the United States. And among them, is something that's a touchy subject, which is the Communist Party USA. Because the Communist Party USA was 40% Black, and many of its members were of European Jewish descent. Now in the 60s, one of the, some of the tropes that emerged were also the tropes of martyrdom. There's this, there's something almost perverse around martyrdom um, narratives because they have this view that somehow really fighting for what's right must entail somehow legitimacy through death. However, there are those who did not die and there are those who continue the struggles. One of the prime examples though of those who did pass away was of course the murder of James Earl Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Henry Sverner. Now what's striking about this was this brought the FBI involved because at this moment it was constructed as two whites who were killed. Now what's not often mentioned as Susanna Heschel mentions in some of her lectures is that as the FBI went through all those swamps because that's where you go to look where they throw black people after they lynch them, they were finding mounds and mounds of corpses of black individuals. And those people, those irreplaceable people were just locked into the anonymous mass of deaths 
because at that moment, the preciousness, the construction of the lives, okay, of Schwerner and Goodman represented a form of whiteness that was a message also to the idea of, of, of light skin Jewishness. I say light skin here because brown and black skin Jews never disappeared. They were just invisibilized. Now, some of the struggles that preceded this more from the left included in situations such as Patterson, Du Bois and others when they charged at the convention for the prevention and punishment of crime of genocide against peoples of the United States, particularly black peoples in the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. This is earlier, okay? Resolution 260. And what's crucial here is that we already have something where we see these varieties of black, they were all communists these groups, by the way, these individuals linked in with, with individuals who were linked to the NAACP and also lawyers such as Raphael Lipkin. And I bring this up mainly to point out that there's a more complex nuance that we would need to deal with when we talk about these struggles. Because you see, the United States was not only anti-communist, the United States was not only a, play, a country that avows democracy, but it was anti-democratic, but it's racism and it was also anti-miscegenation. And a lot of what this coalition represented was manifested already in that looming fear in American racial consciousness, which is miscegenation, mulattoes, mixtures, et cetera. Now I have a short time, so I'm, we could talk later about some of the other details, but one thing I'd like to say is that, as I said, there were many movements, but there were some ev crucial events by 1967 that created fissures because, and we're gonna hear, because as we know already, we have a representative from some of the movements who are here, which is of course the 1967 war in Israel. And the 1967 war created a, a situation that began to affect not only the relationship for non-Jewish blacks and, 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 and Jews, and also around black Jews, which is a troubling issue that has affected Jewish life. Because you see, Jewish life, as we know, we have many celebrations, but if you think of Pesach or Passover, we talk about liberation. And it's very difficult to talk about liberation in the Euro modern age without talking about colonialism. But as we know today, what has eclipsed the language of talking about colonialism and liberation is to shift to the language of anti Semitism. Precisely because to talk about issues of colonialism requires talking about difficult issues about the relationship to Israel. Now, of course, at the moment, what I'd like to stress is that there were other conflicts, not just about Israel. There were conflicts with unions, such as Ocean or Brownsville in New York City. There were different kinds of conflicts that created an opportunity for the rise of neoconservatism. And we already know about Irvin Kristol and the other neoconservatives, but the main thing about neoconservatism is that neoconservatism is fundamentally racist. And neoconservatism fundamentally invests in the idea of a white America that actually makes these fissures, these breakdown of actually fighting as coalitions for more democracy that actually makes those breakdowns not only celebrated, but fetishized. Now, in the midst of this, the left-wing Jews never went away. The very Jews who were fighting uh, on, the, on the behalf of expanding democracy in the United States, in unions, in workers' organizations, those who are connected to black, civil, black organizations, all the way through even to the Black Panthers, they never went away, but we have to understand that the thing about neoconservatism and conservative voices generally, and if we look at the history that went all the way through to Reagan and you know what we have witnessed recently, they scream the loudest. And their loudness eclipses the ongoing work 
that is that have continued. So if we think about the events, for instance, as in last year with Black Lives Matter and the many other groups involved, there are several crucial things to notice. One of the things- I'm uh, wrapping up in the yes, next- Yes, I'm wrapping up. One of the things to notice is that Black Lives Matter, which is also the spin was against Black power movements, Black Lives Matter was not only founded by, among them, a Black Jewish woman, Alicia Garza, but the efforts with Black Lives Matter led to a situation in which the cross-racial coalitions in the streets were not exclusively what would be considered Blacks and Jews. And this is because the ongoing efforts to build an understanding of anti-racist struggles as doing what is right as part of being an, an, a struggle for justice through understanding Judaism continued. So I close with just simply saying that what these coalitions are about is a fight for democracy. It's a fight for dignity and freedom and ultimately fights for what is right. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. That was wonderful. Cortland? Oh, Cortland, we need you to unmute. Listening to the statements of Professor Lewis Gordon um, reminds me of growing up. Um, I came to political consciousness in the 1950s. Um, and I lived in New York. And therefore, I interacted and understood uh, the Jewish community in a different way than if I had grown up in Mississippi or Alabama or other places in the South where most of the SNCC people came from. Um, and, you know, my first consciousness of the Jewish community really was the whole the, the whole um, question question about uh, the Rosenbergs uh, um, you know the the execution of the Rosenbergs and the the because at that point as Professor Gordon states, uh, Jews and Irish and Catholics, I mean, Jews, Irish, Italians, and Greeks were not really considered white people. Wasp, you had to be a wasp to be white. Uh, and that really, I mean, that's what I took, you know, for, for granted. Uh, and, you know, my sense is as I grew a little older and went to school at Howard University, I joined the sit-in movement. And as was stated earlier, we had probably two groupings, the young black students who came out of the HBCUs and formed Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And then you had a number of people in the Jewish community who were either Trotskyite, Stalinist, uh, you know, Yipsel. I mean, they were all groups and uh, they were all groups on, on the left. I, I got close because of my relationship with Byatt Rustin, who was very close to Max Shackman and you know, the Shackmanites and, and, and Yipsel. I joined Yipsel. Um, and, you know, I, I, one of the things that was quite interesting was the kind of anti-communism and hostility to people who were considered Trotskyites and, and Stalinists. One of the things I found, however, with dealing with the people who were in those organizations, um, when we were engaged in a number of demonstrations, um, I found them to be in fact annoying uh, because they tried to bring their own view of the world and impose it on what we were trying to do. Uh, and so much so, on two or three occasions, Stokely Carmichael, who was in school with me, 
and I had to ask Byron Rustin to come and help us deal with the, the political rhetoric and the kind of obstruction that they engaged in. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I think so. And so part of my life when I was in my 19, you know, 19 and 20, it was, you know, on one side dealing with Max Shackman and Michael Harrington and Rochelle Horowitz and Tom Kahn and all those people who belong to, to Ypsil and those organizations. And um, to, the, to the political fights. But I, I did not really, while I was engaged in the discussions and the fights, I, I just viewed them as people who belong to those organizations. I didn't view them as people from the Jewish community. I mean, you know, that was, I, I mean, it was, it was some people who you would, you know, okay, we're gonna go to Baltimore and we're gonna get into this demonstration and we're gonna meet these people. But I mean, you know, my senses was much more on a political discussion. And, you know, my sense is as I grew up, as I grew older, uh, particular during the sit-in movement, the, you know, my, my sense was that you know, there were people who you would agree with and who would in fact go on these demonstrations with you. And then people who would then try to impose their will on the demonstrations. But I, I did not, you know, I, I maybe I was, you know, I had just come from Trinidad when I was 12 years old. So I was just in this country about, you know, six or seven years old. And I just view them as, you know, an annoyance. I mean, cause I really did not have any great depth of understanding about Stalin or Trotsky and the fights that they had and why Trotsky was murdered and all that. Um, and I think so, my sense is that my relationship with the Jewish, the Jewish community was very involved, but not, it was just involved because I was involved politically. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, this is the black community, this is Jewish community. I mean, to the extent that there were people of the Jewish community that I understood, knew, they were either with Max Shackman or they were Trotskyites or Stalinists. I mean, that was, I mean, that was the, the, the discussion that I understood. As I, um, as I, I mean, one of the things that was very, you know, prevalent and I mean, and particularly impacting the Jewish community was McCarthy, you know, uh, and McCarthyism. And, and, and it was interesting because one of the things that they tried to do as we traveled to Mississippi and to other places in the South is try to put the label of communists on us and say we were communists, particularly, you know, if we were talking to people like Ann Braden and Carl Braden and people like that. And so my sense is that, you know, as they tried to put the communist label on us, which intimidated most whites and most people in the Jewish community. I mean, it was just overwhelming the kind of, I mean, what we see now with Trumpism, it was probably 10 times worse. And one of the things that was really, I mean, I think helped to, to destroy McCarthyism is that we totally ignored them and the black community ignored them. I mean, I remember going to Mississippi in 1962, 63. And a woman came up to me and she said, you know, I'm really glad you communists are here to help us because they viewed communism as a way of getting help, of getting a way of dealing with. So that was really, you know, something that they, they, they were, you know, very happy to have if it was gonna help them. I think the next big fight we had in SNCC was the question of who would be our lawyers. Um, the, the, 
the you know one of the, the 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 best lawyers we had were part of the lawyers guild and most of those were people from the jewish community um and they i mean they've tried to put the communist label on us i mean the kennedys and others tried to put the communist label on it and we you know decided that we needed good lawyers we didn't need you know people who were uh, not going to be our best advocates. So I think there was a big part of SNCC. A number of people from the Jewish community were in the Lawyers Guild, and they were very helpful. Now, as far as as I remember, you know, people in the Jewish community, people like Gadi Zellner and Larry Rubin and Ira and people like that, they were people who were prepared to work. I. I you know, in those circumstances where your butt is on the line, you don't want to know whether they're white or Jewish or Italian, whatever. You want to know that they will stand with you. So, I mean, all the people I know today from SNCC, well, you know, the, the, uh, we, have, we have one standard. Were they there? Did they work? At least that's the standard I have. Were they there? Did they work? And did they make a difference? Uh, now, I do think it was as mentioned by Professor Gordon that the 67 uh, war did make a big difference in terms of a number of people in SNCC. I mean, I was, when the war started, I was in Morocco. Uh, and you know, I did hear, you know, a different view of what was going on as if I would have been in the United States. But it does seem to me that I think that, you know, the statement that was made and wasn't a, a policy statement by SNCC, it was a statement that was brought to us by a young lady in, a, uh, in, uh, in Chicago that was published in the SNCC paper. And, and okay, I was okay. I'm timing myself. Uh, it would give, um, you know, which which caused a great deal of disruption uh, in the American Jewish community was something that you know occurred uh, as a result of the '67 war. But I just want to sum it up I'm, by saying, first, most of my relationship with the Jewish community was really because I was from New York. I was, you know, and it was not something that was SNCC related. It was much more personal related and was much more in as part of the early movement when we are dealing with sit-ins and the kind of back and forth political things that we were under. That the, we got a great deal of support from a number of people in the Jewish community uh, but for as organizationally, it was the Lawyers Guild, but we had people throughout the organization who were SNCC field secretaries who were valued because of their work. I must say that at the end of the day, you know, in 1967, when the war broke out, and even today, the relationship between the state of Israel and Palestine is a question that impacts the Jew, black Jewish relationships. And I'll stop there and we can, you know, well, I think it's 12 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Cortland. I imagine you'll get some follow-up questions on that a little bit later. Uh, Ira, you're up. Okay, thank you. I must be naive. I had no idea that we would be so far left in this discussion. So I have to change a few of the things that I, I've written down, so we'll all go to jail together. Um, I was a founder of the W.E.B. Du Bois Club when it first founded, which was a socialist was it of a different stripe than the SWP. I'll start by saying first, sisters and brothers, and we are all of us sisters and brothers, and that's not being trite or corny or platitudinous. That's what it is. I'm humbled to be on the same podium 
with Cortland and the two professors. I wish also to recognize several freedom riders and other civil rights movement vets also viewing this webinar. And an amazing white Presbyterian minister with his pulpit then in Columbia, Mississippi, in the southern part of the state in the 1960s, where I spent a lot of time. I only learned maybe 10 years ago that he was a strong supporter of civil rights. And to our Latino guests here, nos honra tu presencia. As well, this is a, an amazing group of people. I contacted people in different places and due to the time zone, they're, they're not all gonna be seeing this in person, but they will be on tape in Japan, Argentina, Abu Dhabi, the West Bank, Israel, and possibly the Gaza Strip. Also the wonderful folk from ANAR, the European Network Against Racism. I know the professors and Brother Cortland are not disappointing you. I hope I can bask in their reflected clarity. The title of this discussion actually needs clarification. Is it black hyphen Jewish? If Jews are black, or some Jews are black, how do you make that differentiation? I don't know the, the, the best terminology, the best wording to use, but even this we have to contemplate, and I'm not a Freudian. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, home to the Kentucky Derby and the police who ended the life of Breonna Taylor. And I am originally from Brooklyn, New York. That's where I first got involved in the civil rights movement. My parents came from Orthodox Jewish stock, though daddy was politicized during the Great Depression of the 1930s. My grandfather would neither brush his teeth nor rinse his mouth, mom would tell me, on Yom Kippur lest he accidentally swallow toothpaste and water and quench his hunger and thirst. I went to Cheder, Hebrew school, four days a week after elementary school and on Sunday from age eight to 13. This yielded two results. One, I was bar mitzvahed and two, I resolved never to set foot in a fucking synagogue again. But I do even as a secular Jew have a pull in that direction at times. I don't wanna take any chances. I first became involved in the civil rights movement around 1959. In 1960, the day after the sit-in by four African-American college students at a Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, Daddy and I picketed our neighborhood Woolworth store in Brooklyn. Most of the would-be patrons were working Jews and a few crossed the picket line. I remained active in civil rights in New York for several years my first arrest was in New York City. My mother was not happy. But the main action was in the South. So I headed first to Georgia and then to Mississippi. The civil rights movement would enhance my consciousness as a Jew, as it would turn out. In Mississippi, Blacks generally and Black and white civil rights workers in particular faced unbelievable danger, jailings, beatings, economic reprisals, and sometimes death. I attended church services many Sundays in the black communities in which I was privileged to live. <clears throat> it was the only place a Mississippi black man could wear a suit and tie and a Mississippi black woman a dress and hose and address each other as sister and brother. If religion was an opiate, and it was, it also was an anchor, a refuge. So I decided to find out who I was as a Jew. I became offended by many progressive Jews I knew who are well-versed in African-American history as well they should be, yet knew so little of their own people. For several years, I had been reading Jewish Currents magazine and works by Nathan Ossible and Morris Shappies. I knew Morris. Morris bounced my oldest son on his knee at his magazine's office, office in Union Square in New York. And my boy is now 51. I began my religious inquiry by reading the Hebrew Bible, skipping only that this one begat that one and focusing on, for example, Deuteronomy. I command thee saying, thou shalt 
open thine hand wide unto thy brother and sister, to thy poor, to thy needy in the land. I added the word sister to the quote, and that's a, an under geschäft, another tale to come. Culture became for me not just technique, sensuousness, and aesthetics. I could not enjoy culture when it was connected to torture. No art for art's sake for me. For example, during the Nazi period, Ilsa Koch designed very pretty lampshades. Could the fact that they were made from the skins of murdered Jews inhibit one's enjoy enjoyment? Nor can I forget the beautiful parks I visited in Israel in six trips over many years, built on land once peopled by my Palestinian cousins. Returning to Mississippi. This is why I'll never be an organizer. Well. Returning to Mississippi, Vernon Damer, leader of the NAACP in Hattiesburg in the 1960s, went on the radio to urge his people to register and vote. A minister from the Delta Ministry of the National Council of Churches and I went to visit Mr. Damer. Mr. Damer gave us a sign which had been affixed to a tree near his house. And now I can't find the damn sign. Well, there's a copy of the sign there. The, the, the original sign is in the um, archives at the University of Southern Mississippi Library. The sign pictures a large Klansman in a white robe pointing at you with the slogan, I want you in the white knights of the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan. It was the death threat of the Klan. Six months later, Mr. Damer was dead. The Klan had hurled a firebomb into his home, burning him over 80% of his body. One of my daughters was named after him. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel became a real scholar to me when he marched alongside Reverend Martin Luther King as much for marching as for his two volume work on the prophets. The Jewish proletarian poets of the turn of the 20th century turned me on. Listen to Morris Rosenfeld. Don't look for me where myrtles bloom. You won't find me there, my love. By the machines where lives wither, there you'll find my place of rest. Emma Lazarus also was a big influence on me. The religion of my people became but one aspect of my understanding of the relationship of economic base to superstructure, which led me to try to understand the question of questions. Did Jews meekly march to the ovens, to the gas ovens, Sidorim in hand during the Holocaust? Yuri Sewell's magnificent book, We Fought Back, in the shtetls, the ghettos of Nazi-occupied Europe, even in Berlin. Also as participants from the US and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and the 7,000 volunteers in the five international brigades from all over the world, fighting to prevent Spain from becoming the dress rehearsal for World War II. I learned most particularly that culture and religion are reflections of the historical moment that there are those who accommodate and those who resist. That I have learned common with Kevin Barry, the Irish patriot who resisted the British and paid with his life, than with those Jews who collaborated with the fascists. As well, the Sheldon Edelsteins and those who are trying as we speak to sanitize Bernie Madoff, the big farmer vampires and others. I also learned I share a bond with one senior, Angelo Roncalli, later to become Pope John the 23rd, who helped rescue tens of thousands of Jews. We are our sister and brother's keeper. The life of a Palestinian fighting for a homeland must be as sacred and revered as that of a Jew. Please let me describe a religious experience of mine. It occurred in Jackson, Mississippi, where 950 of us were arrested in one of the largest mass jailings of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. I was in the first wave of those arrested. We were protesting the illegal convening of the Mississippi State Legislature, illegal because of the disfranchisement of its black citizens. 
We arrived in prison trucks at the state fairgrounds where cattle had been kept and then moved, and which were the same buildings where we would be housed. Women and men were separated, and I didn't see my jailed sisters in the struggle until we were released on bond about two weeks later. I heard that a pregnant black female prisoner was beaten and suffered a miscarriage. After being booked, we had to pass through a cordon of Mississippi State Police. Some of us were beaten. In the cavernous hall where we wound up, there were additional beatings for protesting the cops segregating us. Black civil rights protesters on one side, facing whites on the other. When dinner was to be served, the guards as a form of control and humiliation forced the whites to line up first. Each white inmate was given a slice of bologna stuck between two stale pieces of bread and a paper cup with milk, or rather water with a little milk powder. Each white guy returned with his meal to his spot on the cement floor on the white side, sat down cross-legged and placed the, the cup on the floor, sandwich on top of the cup in front of him. Then the African-American civil rights prisoners lined up to get sandwich and milk. They returned to, to their spots on the colored side, sat down cross-legged, placing a cup on hard cement floor and sandwich atop. No one ate, no one drank. After the last black prisoner took his seat, all of us prisoners, black and white together, and without prearrangement, without prearrangement, picked up our sandwiches and broke bread as one. Were I a Catholic, I would have thought of Holy Communion, but I am a Jew, so I must relate this to the Jewish culture and religion of this secular Jew in Psalm 91, which I will make gender neutral. I am with those in distress. I will release them and I will, will utter them. As to the present, an op-ed from JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, dated July 16th, 2015. For Black Orthodox Jews, constant racism is exhausting. It was written by, by Chava Shervington, or maybe Chava Shervington president of the Jewish Multiracial Network. And I quote, when I was 24, an Orthodox matchmaker tried to set me up on a date. When I objected, she told me, stop being so picky. Not many girls, not many guys are willing to consider a black girl. As an African-American Orthodox Jew, this was hardly my first encounter with the questionable treatment I and my fellow Jews of color endure, continuing the quote. At one yeshiva in Brooklyn, the mother of a biracial student was asked to stay away from the school because it made the other parents uncomfortable. An African-American acquaintance told me to, he overheard a worshiper at Morning Minion talking about how he didn't want to daven with a schwarze while my acquaintance was putting on his tefillin. End quote. The word schwarze simply means black, but its intonation can be everyday wording or racist. My mother used it both ways. I have to Israel, wrap up in a minute or two. Israel is proportionately the most COVID vaccinated country, but only if you are Jewish. Are Palestinians going to? Americans, in Israel and the US, either we will live together or we will die together. Power to the people, no pasaran. Wonderful, thank you, Ira. Uh, Cheryl, handing it over to you now. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you both, and actually thank all three of you. It's really an honor to be with three heroes at the same time, uh, and I'm really grateful to be here. Um, my job is to um, interview you both, uh, but I wanted to focus on three things that I think you all raised um, and see if we can push it a little bit um, further. The first is um, we talk about 
the Black Jewish relation, relationship, which we've all acknowledged is a Black white Jewish relationship, because after all, Black Jews have their own relationship with Blackness, right? Um, so the Black Jewish relationship that we talk about, I would like to contrast that, or at least compare that to the relationship on the ground, is what we now think of as the Black white Jewish relationship. How did that manifest itself in actual life? And you both spoke to that a little bit, but I want to go a little further. Um, the second issue that I think you raised that's really important is when we say Blacks and white Jews, are we talking about the same people? What I mean is, were the people in SNCC, were the Jews in SNCC, the same Jews as the rabbis who marched or the American Jewish Committee uh, folks, right? So that when we, who did um, more formal things. So in other words, when we say, Black Jewish relations, even forgetting about the race piece, aren't we putting together too many different um, groups of Black and Jewish people um, into, one, into one basket? And again, both of you um, talked about that. But again, are Jews who, um, how should I say this? Um, are we lumping together people who moved who, Jewish uh, white Jews who moved politically as opposed to religiously? How do we understand those different um, relationships to, to Judaism? Uh, and the third issue that I want to touch on uh, is the question of whiteness, uh, which again, we've, we've all, we've all um, touched on. Um, and therefore, white Jews power as white people and how those tensions um, manifested themselves Again, out here, what we know about, how do they manifest themselves uh, inside the work? So there were all sorts of tensions, again, between uh, white Jews who were wealthier, who had opportunities that African-Americans didn't. There were tensions all the way through in the larger, in the larger world. So what, I'm, what I would like to pursue is, how did those tensions play out in the, in the civil rights community? Um, again, we talked a little bit about Israel, we should talk um, some more, but there were many tensions, I think, that whiteness raised. And my sense is, at least currently, that many white Jews don't like to admit that they're white. And what that means is that they're not taking responsibility for their role in white privilege, their role in white supremacy, essentially, those, those structures that helped white people get uh, get advanced. And so if you don't confront those issues, if you don't admit to deal to having to deal with it, then it just gets ignored. And what I'm concerned about, and the reason I want to raise it here, is that if we ignore them now, Jews are not going to be, white Jews are not going to be able to play any effective role in the civil rights movement. So I've laid that out sort of vaguely, and I apologize, um, but I want to start then by asking you, um, Cortland, um, you said that you were aware of people in, in terms of how they did their work, um, rather than this person was Jewish, this person was Italian, whatever. But would you say that that was generally true? How do you think Black activists saw their white Jewish colleagues? Did they see them as white people? Did they see them as Jews? Did they see them in some other way? How? How is their Judaism seen at all? I mean, I, I think, first of all, let me just say, most people in the Black community probably don't interact or has not never interacted with people in the Jewish community. I mean, so that is, so we're not talking about a small segment of, of people. And I think, you know, in, in SNCC, which is what I know, I don't know others, you know, differences were noted. And differences were noted not only on the question of whiteness, but there, there were several layers within the Black community. I faced, I faced two of them. The first is that I was born in New York. And so, you know, when I'm in South, somebody might say, you know, you're coming down here as a Northern Negro, right? So, I mean, that was, that was an identity. 
And even beyond that, within that, uh, you know, Stokely Carmichael, Ivanhoe, Donaldson, myself, who were all born in, I mean, the West Indians have West Indian heritage, uh, had, you know, they, they would, it got so that even appeared in the New York Times, I mean, you know, the Time Magazine about how we were different because we grew up in an environment where there were, where people saw themselves in charge and running things so that we had a different attitude than people in the, in, in Black people in the South. So my, my sense, I don't, I mean, my sense is that clearly people have differences, you know, you know, somebody said, well, you know, you're from rural Alabama as opposed to urban Alabama. So all, I mean, so the question about whether you're Jewish or whether you're white, all these things come up and play into play. But the question is, was this a dominant discussion? Uh, and I don't, I mean, my sense is, you know, at some point, the question of whiteness did come up. And the question of whiteness, and I think, well, it, let's talk about 1964, uh, was mentioned when, you know, uh, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman got killed. Um, you know, many people in the South felt that if it were not, if it were just Cheney, nobody would care. So that, I mean, so the question of whiteness came up and, you know, and, you know, uh, Sh uh, Schwerner's wife was very clear about that. I mean, you know, she was so, I mean, I think for me, that's the first time I, I see the question of whiteness coming up. It's not within the organization, but it's an acknowledgement that if it were not for Schroeder and Goodman, nobody would care about Cheney. So that is one aspect. I think the other thing that's come up is that at, on the question of whiteness, at some point, people in SNCC who were black said, you know, the problem of racism isn't in the black community. It exists in the white community. And therefore, we would really be good if those who understood what was going on, who were white, would go to the white communities and do what's happening. I mean, you see that happening now with Black Lives Matter, but we were raising it then. So, I mean, I think though, as far as I can remember, the question of whiteness and the question of Jewishness and so forth came up I mean, people understand the question of, of you know, who it gets, um, you know, who gets defined in particular ways. But one of the things I do want to avoid is I, I don't believe in this, and I, I really try to avoid telling people about white privilege, because my sense is that there is, there is, I see in too many in, involvements and too many engagements that it is a, a very disruptive thing to the, to the, I mean, I'm at, at Duke University and people, black people are saying, well, I, I'm scared of coming up here because of white privilege and white people. And I'm saying to myself, what is this stupidness? You know, I am who, I mean, I'm what Malcolm used to say, I am the man you think you are. And I encourage, you know, all black people to have that mindset. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I, 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 to me, white privilege is nothing. You know, I'm the one that's privileged and I'm having that mindset. So, I mean, I'm just saying, I, it's a long way in terms of answering your question, but I do think again, that the, the question of whiteness and Jewishness really was not a big, big discussion within SNCC. Uh, can you, I uh, can I say something? Um, yeah, thank you, Cortland. Um, there are several things I, I just want to say very quickly. Uh, the one uh, one difficult issue and why I brought up the neoconservatives is that they're good at spin. So there are terms that get twisted. For instance, the Soviet Union term "political correctness," which meant toting the party line was twisted in the 80s into political correctness here, which is not actually political correctness. It's really about moral correctness. 
because the question, because in many ways, what's the subtext of their charge is to try to assert that the right political stand to have in the United States is actually white supremacy. The second thing is you're absolutely right. The privileged discourse is one of those disruptive ones because it's such a butchering of language. Privileges can refer to good things. You could have, we, we have a privilege to be able to address an audience right now, but you don't have a privilege to murder, maim, treat people with disrespect. However, in a country that does not make you accountable, you have a license. And I've argued there's something wrong with white license. White supremacy is about a license to do whatever a white person pleases onto non-white peoples. And the thing about a license, why it's important rather than a privilege is because you see, if you lock a privilege intrinsically into a people's identity, right? But the privilege is about good things. Are we really to tell people to fight against having good schools, security, food, shelter? If you notice, they're all the things that for a, a healthy democracy, everybody should have. The issue isn't that white people have privileges. The issue is that these are things being kept from others. But license, if someone gives you a license to do something wrong, you can join the people who don't have the license to get rid of anybody having that license. And what you can fight for that everybody should have or everybody should get rid of, that is political. And so I think, I think your point, Cortland, is right, right on. One last thing I want to say quickly is we are talking in the U.S. context, and the U.S. context is constantly changing and twisting its racial language to hide from itself. And if I pick Jewish people as an example, um, it's hard for many American Jews to understand this. But there are places in which Jewish people's national identity have nothing to do with whiteness. And what I mean like that is uh, when I'm, um, I, I was born on an island, Jamaica, from Sephardic and Misraki people. Now, because the national identity of Jamaica is black, when you think of a Jamaican, even though Jamaica is a multiracial country, you think of it as black people. So it meant all the Jews I knew in my childhood, you see what I'm getting at, had a black identity, but, is, but when they traveled, their identity, racial identity changed because my family looked like the screen right now. I have relatives who look like Ira, like Cheryl, and who look like you, you Cortland, and me, who are all Jews. And so I, when, I, I, know, I know a Jewish leader in Jamaica right now when you talk to him, he's a black man. When he lands in Boston to go to Jewish meetings, he's a white man. <laughs> and when he goes to another place, he's another. And I've had that experience. I've never called white, but I've been in places where I land as an Arab and another place where I land as, you know, a Tamil Indian or whatever. And so this is the tricky part because some of, I'm, I'm saying this because I've been answering to save time in the Q&A, some of the written answers. And when we talk about, Jews and blackness or Jews and race, we're not really saying it's a fixed thing, the way we say talk about African American. We're talking about what it is in a country that tries to lock you into either you're white or you're everything else. And many Jews have been many everything else, but now there are Jews who are also white. And that is true. And what that means is tricky because there's one last thing. There was a questioner who was talking about, say, Black anti-Semites. But the thing I had said to that questioner is, you know, one thing you know for fact is Black people don't have power in America. I mean, it, at the end of the day, those Tiki Torch people talking about Jews will not replace us, were linked to the president of the United States. And there are white supremacist organizations who bomb, blow up synagogues. That's not Black people. And the structure, there are police forces that have Nazi training manuals, as Ira may point out, in Kentucky. So we have to get for real here. It may bruise our feelings. And I know there are Black people, for instance, who don't like other Black people. There are Black people who don't like Black Latinos. They're black, but they don't have power. So let's just deal with that power issue, is what I would recommend. 
Yeah, I'd like to continue in that vein, if I may. Um, I too feel that the term white skin privileges is disruptive. A privilege is a relative thing. It's not an absolute thing. I worked on an assembly line for 24 years. It was not a privilege for me to sell my labor power for a wage, but it was relative in that many African-Americans were not hired. Well, in the particular plant that I was, the company was very smart. They hired African-Americans in disproportionate numbers because they wanted to keep control, but that's another story. Um, but there are problems have their, their universalities and they have their particularities. Dr. Alvin Poussant, who was a, a, a doctor in, in Mississippi during the civil rights movement, wrote a pamphlet called the White African Queen Complex. And it dealt with the sexual relationships between white women and African-American men in the civil rights movement. This is not the place to go into it, nor do I, do I have an authoritative understanding of it. But you do have to deal with contradictions. Um, I always talk about contradictions having universalities and particularities. We have to discuss that as well. Um, I read a book some time ago, I guess there were two books, but the one that I remember was how Jews became white folk. And I would say strongly suggest people look at that book, not because you would agree with everything in there, but it gives you a context within which to discuss this. Well, I, I, I don't know how better to delve into this better than what Lewis and Cortland did, and maybe Cheryl has insights that I don't have. But this whole business of, 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 of white skin privilege needs to be discussed in, a, in its absolute. I've had a lot of discussions with people who don't agree with me on this and have attacked me for, for, for being objectively racist. In, in a, but I, I think it has to be contextualized within the framework that uh, Lewis and, and, and Cortland talked about. One, one last thing, if I may. Um, it seems to pale this discussion in contrast to the danger in the civil rights movement. You didn't know whether when you wake, wake up, you're gonna be alive. I was not involved in the South as long as Cortland was. I, I was involved in the North for several years in the beginning. But we had to survive. In, in Marion County in Columbia, we civil rights workers slept on the floor in, in, the, in, a, in a shack because the Klan had fired in over people's heads. I was not there at the time. I was in another Mississippi place. But it, we didn't have time for these academic, esoteric, polysyllabic with the proper syntax discussions. I'm sorry. We, we were trying to save our asses and trying to, to deal with the, with the concrete realities that, that per, pertained at that time, that prevailed. So it, for, for me, again, I don't know how to approach this any better than what I've said, and certainly Cortland and Lewis, and I'd like to hear Cheryl's view on this as, as well. But I tell you people who focus on that, get over that shit. Well, in a way, we've sort of come full circle back to the to the point um, that I was starting with. I, let me just say one thing about the, the white privilege thing. First of all, someone once came up to me and said, I don't consider my, that I have white privilege. It's not a privilege, it's a right. And the problem is that black people don't have the same rights. So I loved your, your um, word, Lewis, about license. I think that's a, a really a good um, intervention as they say. Um, but what I meant by white privilege is that Jew, white people acted in certain ways in the movement because they were white. And they were used to doing things. They were used to having control. They were used to having being educated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, we've talked about those sorts of, of tensions. But if you deny 
And certainly that is true now that white people still have a different kind of power um, in the community, I mean, in the, in the world, in the United States at least, than um, black people do. And to the extent that white Jews won't admit that they are white to themselves, my question is, will they ask of themselves, what am I doing wrong, right? How can I approach this, this um, struggle differently? So let me just give you one example and then I'll come back to um, the question about uh, being alive because I think that's really central. Um, the best example that I can give of the white privilege of Jews is when I talk about um, Black Lives Matter in a Jewish setting and these white Jews will say to me, well, I can't support Black Lives Matter unless they denounce Farrakhan. And I just say to them, essentially, who do you think you are? You don't run Black Lives Matter. If either, what you're saying is, I don't care enough about civil rights to work with this group unless they do something for me. And once I say that, of course, then they back off and say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm in support of, of civil rights. But the, the fact that they can, that these, these audiences at least, feel that they have this quid pro quo thing going, that they have the ability to set the terms in an equal way in a movement that is not theirs, that's what I meant by taking your whiteness seriously in that that sort of, you get to say that, right? So that's, that's what I meant is the, is the challenge to challenge white Jews about being sensitive to the ways in which their whiteness gets in the way of the struggle. But that brings me back to your question, Ira, your point about that you never knew when you were gonna wake up. One of the things that I encountered over and over again when I was doing my research on black Jewish relations in the civil rights movement is that it's a term that in many cases we have put on you, you activist folks, right? That were, was not necessarily there at the time, right? As you said, you were too busy staying alive, right? You were too busy trying to get the work done to think in terms of, oh, I trust you because you're Jewish or, oh, I, whatever, that, that the, the black Jewish relationship, the, oh, we've all, you know, we all care about each other um, was not salient at the time. What was, what was, a, what was at issue was, how do you get the work done, right? And so I wanna ask you, Ira, the same kind of question that I just asked Cortland, which is, you said, you spoke a little bit about how you felt in the civil rights, while you were doing the civil rights work, um, that you felt more political, but also you went back into your Jewish heritage to, to understand what you were doing there. And I wanted to ask you what you thought in general, other white Jewish activists um, felt, were they, how did they understand themselves as white? Did they understand themselves as Jewish? Did they think about being Jewish? How did they understand their Judaism? Um, I don't know if you can speak to anybody else's position, but if you have a sense. I'll try, but I just, I wanna say that I found the sign I wanna show you oh. one more, because this does pertain to this. This, right. this is a copy of the sign that was put on Bernard Damer's home before mm -hmm. six months before he was assassinated. Now, did they really want an African American person to join the Ku Klux Klan? No, but this was the death threat, and mm -hmm. Mr. Damer said he was not afraid. He would go on. Bet he was afraid, but he went on. Damn right, he was afraid. He, when when they surrounded his house, I was told by one of the family members. He grabbed his piece, his weapon, and he drove him off. His wife escaped. His daughter was burned, but she escaped. And Mr. Dame was burned on 80% of his body and died two, two days later. So when I discuss all these academic esoteric points with a proper syllogism, a syllogistic reasoning, a proper syntax, and morphology and all this other shit that's been in my head for a long time. I always have to look back at this sign. And this sign is still here. This, look, look at what's happened in the last number of years. 
the shit is rising again. As far as how you proceed from this, I'm going to divert, divert this, Cheryl, and just talk about some of the things that most impressed me about SNCC and how it deal, dealt with it, because they had different opinions. I was approached by a guy named Willie McRae. I don't think he's living any longer, is he, Cortland? Okay. And he, he said to me, he says, I have a friend I want you to meet. And they're going to study. Uh, they want to study about Judaism. They want to study about Israel and Palestine. And you're Jewish and you're a smart boy. Why don't you talk to them? I could not talk to them because I didn't know anything, or more appropriately, I didn't know nothing, nothing about this. I, I, I just did not know. And I've been reading ever since, it's a lot of years, and I taught a class partly on, on this at a university. But SNCC gave me an opportunity, not just SNCC, but the, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, to try to delve into these things. And when, when Willie McRae had this guy ask me about Vietnam and I didn't know, I was just so embarrassed. I just didn't know. That's the way I have to deal with it. So I'm not answering your question directly, Cheryl. I'm simply saying that this is all has to be contextualized. It's, it's all of a piece. And how to proceed from here, I'll be damned if I know. In a way, you are both answering the question. Um, and in fact, so did you, Lewis, when you pointed out that you're all speaking from a leftist political position, that your motivations are progressive. And it seems to me, at least, that to call things, you know, the special bond between blacks and Jews, again, white Jews, um, is to put too much emphasis on the religious piece and not enough emphasis on the political piece. And so um, it sounds to me like what you're all suggesting is that the politics of the person that you were working with was more, much more important than the self-identity in the sense of right, Jewish or not Jewish. Do you think that that's, that that's true, that what we call the Black-Jewish relationship might more properly be called the Black progressive Jewish relationship? I'll start. There were different Jews, like they're different to everybody's. The, uh, I grew up in a, in a Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, and we moved one step up on the socioeconomic scale to a city housing project. And that's a long story too. It involved Donald Trump's father who screwed everybody. But anyhow. I'm shocked to hear that. Yeah, and, and in Chicago, there was a wonderful rabbi. I think his name was Rabbi Wolf. And I knew somebody from the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs who talked to me about him. These were Jews who were very active in the civil rights movement, but they were very wealthy. And so I can't talk about Jews of a piece. It, 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 it's Jews and how they relate to the socioeconomic surroundings that they countenance. Um, that's the best I can do. I'm sorry, Cheryl, I can't go further on that. Uh, absolutely. Um, but in a way that is <laughs> he was, again, an answer. Um, yeah, Portland, was, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go sure. ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, yeah, no, no. I mean, Rabbi Wolf was my was uh, my my wife's rabbi, by the way, <laughs> and yeah, she absolutely loved him. He's a wonderful man. He was also one of my students, Rabbi, when I when I was at Yale, and uh, yeah, he's one of these people where just a human being. He was. It's almost difficult for people to talk about him without tears coming to their eyes, and it's because he was just so loving. And, you know, but the, the political part, I was thinking what Cortland said also about New York, because I, even though I talked earlier about where I was born, I, as a child, I grew up in New York. And, and so even though my background 
was not, uh, say, the Yiddish background. Everybody who grows up in New York ends up speaking some form, of, some degree of Yiddish. <laughs> and so, you know, and so, but the thing is, you're absolutely right, Cheryl. Um, it's about the question of political responsibility. And there was one questioner earlier who was bringing up Takun Alum, even though we put it in a religious context, it's pretty obvious the ending of my opening remarks is about Takun Alum, okay? That ultimately, when at the end of the day, the, the obligation that we're trying to present as an, even though it's presented as an ethical obligation, the question of political responsibility is always for an entire country, an entire people or the globe. If you're an environmentalist or if you're a global humanist, it's for the globe. And that is, uh, I, even though we, are, we bring it up in a lot of black and white things, what some of us don't realize is that, and I'm speaking as a black Jew, and it's funny, I'm just saying it because I'm in the US context. I hate the term saying white Jew, black Jew, you know, it's, but it's contextual. But I remember, but there's a lot of political work I, I um, have done and uh, in academic contexts, I don't talk about them often, mainly because there's a way in which I'm critical of academics who commodify their political identity, you, you see? But I could tell a story about, there was a period where I was doing a lot of political work and here I am, you know, this Jewish guy, black Jewish guy, and, but this is dealing with black activism. And there was a moment, there was a group I was working with in New Haven, where a lot of the issues we're, talk, we're talking about right now are faced because the, the, the other brothers, we say, and sisters, even though they're all, we're all technically right black, some were Muslim, some were people who were incarcerated and just came out. Some were people who were Christian, some were secular. Some were not religious. And even when I talk, I mean, my attitude wasn't, uh, even though a, a group is, you know, Jewish, wasn't like as a religious identity. Because a lot of American Jews don't know that Jews in the rest of the world actually look at Jewish people in racial ethnic terms, not religious terms. That's a very European, North American thing. And so the complex, and the thing that's hard for many Americans to understand too is it is possible to be more than one race at the same time, you know, that's a whole other can of worms. But my point is that there's certain points at which when you're in struggle, your differences also come out. And there's a point at which you have to make a decision. And that struggle I'm talking about was one in which we were trying to deal with severe conflicts in a community that meant we had to go <coughs> into parks and deal with people who could kill us. And at that moment, we had to walk in with a commitment. And I think this is some of what Ira and, and Cortland were talking about, about understanding that they were fighting for something greater than ourselves, you see? And I think that's what Tikkun Alam, but also what political responsibility is about. And so thank you for bringing up that nuance. Well, actually, thank you. Um, the, I want to come back to this question about tikkun olam because it, it does bring us back to the question about in what ways Jews got involved with the civil rights movement, in what ways do they understand their self, their involvement. When I was growing up, to support the civil rights movement was to be Jewish, right? It was as much, much tzedakah charity to give to the NAACP as it was to the Jewish National Fund or, or whatever it was. Um, but that has not always been true. So I believe this, my, my Jewish identity is wrapped up in these issues. But there weren't any Jews in the abolitionist movement, right? There weren't, um, there has not always historically been a Jewish presence on the progressive side of things. So my understanding of what it means to be Jewish is a very different thing from other people. It, as again, all of you know, Many Jews got involved in the civil rights movement, but the more religious you were, the less likely it was that you were gonna be. And there were very few Orthodox Jews engaged in, in civil rights work. So all I'm saying is that I think there are, there are different understandings of what, what it means to be Jewish and that people 
that see this as a tikkun olam thing are a particular kind of Jewish, have a particular kind of Jewish identity. And I guess that's what I, I mean. Um, and it that brings me back to what you were talking about, Cortland, about the Jews in the National Lawyers Guild, et cetera, which is on the one hand, you said, I didn't know who, what anybody was, that wasn't important. And yet you were able to identify all the Jews. Could you have identified all the Methodists, for example? In other words, is there something specific about Jewish identity that was important and significant? I mean, I, I think the I'm thing so that sorry, was... we're not going to be able to uh, get to that question. We have a hard deadline uh, because of our ASL interpreters and the closed captioners. I'm... Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Don't worry. I didn't want to interrupt because, you know, the conversation was critical and uh, going in the right direction. Anyways, I, I just want to thank everyone who made this event possible, our panelists, the interpreters, the captioners, our Jude organizers, the volunteers, the students. Uh, Jay Fredge, Jewish Currents, um, and everyone who, uh, you know, came to listen and participates. Uh, if you want to help us continue hosting events like these, please consider making a small donation. Uh, we threw the link into the chat. Um, and I think we're going to have to end it there, but thank you everyone for showing up. Good night. Thank you all. Keep, all safe, right. and, keep safe and healthy and find joy. Remember your humanity. <laughs>